volcánico. Eh, afortunado, lamentablemente, no hay traducción simultánea, es en inglés. Sin embargo, eh, hemos podido hacer eh, he podido su presentación y escribe mucho del texto que eh, maneja para que igual es mucho más fácil para la mayoría de nosotros que escuchar. Y si no, eh, igual en la ronda de preguntas también tenemos personas que eh, manejan no nada más bien el tema, sino también muy bien el idioma inglés, que se puede hacer alguna especie de, de traducción en el momento de preguntas que sería finalizar eh, el proyecto que probablemente el doctor hablará acerca de ahora, si les parece bien. Entonces, pues ya empezando con el inglés, porque el doctor habla muy bien español, me gusta. Eh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming to, to this, uh, to, to this uh, talk about uh, environmental ethics in the Anthropocene. Uh, uh, Dr. Carico, welcome to Mexico and the science faculty at UNAM. Uh, let me introduce you to the people that will here today. Uh, John Mercalico is a philosopher whose work has been at the forefront of new field in environmental uh, <coughs> philosophy and ethics. He is a university distinguished research professor and a member of the Department of Philosophy in the Institute of Applied Science in University of North of, of Texas. Dr. Calico held the position of Professor of Philosophy in Natural Resources uh, there and uh, he serves as Vice President, the President of the Inter International Society for the Environmental Ethics. Dr. Calico is widely considered to be the leading contemporary exponent of Alodeobots, land ethics. Calico books in defense of the land ethics the intellectual foundation of Leopold's outlook in and seeks to provide it with a more complete philosophical framework. <coughs> Today, he will speak at a conference on the topic of global change and the Anthropocene. Uh, the title of his talk is Invermental, igual que la de Creationism. Creationism. Uh, <laughs> environmental ethics and anthropocene is based on the article that he prepared for the new encyclopedia of anthropocene. Thanks for uh, accepting the, the, the ask to come. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be invited to this great university to speak to this distinguished faculty and students. So uh, my uh, humblest apologies for not being able to speak Spanish. Uh, it's muy poquito. <laughs> uh, the title is Environmental Ethics in the Anthropocene. Um, I'd like to begin with actually some of the first loves of mine in philosophy, which were the ancient Greeks. I think we can still learn. Um, this is a quotation from uh, Protagoras, maligned by Plato as a sophist, but uh, a moral and political philosopher contemporary with Socrates. He says, of all things, the measure is man, of things that are that they are, of things that are not that they are not. And ancient Greek units of measurement, just as those still in common use in the United States, are body parts of human beings, the finger, the foot, and so on, that provides literal, literal interpretation of Protagoras' dictum, although it is usually thought to be a declaration of radical uh, relativism. Um, Plato provides a kind of corrective to this. He says, things of the same size appear larger when seen at hand and smaller when seen from distance. Therefore, 
If our salvation depends on the right choice of pleasures and pains, be they more or fewer, greater or lesser, farther or nearer, what would be what in, excuse me, what would be our salvation in life? Would it be the art of measurement or the power of appearance? Doesn't our salvation seem, first of all, <coughs> to be measurement which is the study of relative excess and deficiency and quality. So let's counter the power of appearance with the art of measurement, our salvation from the Anthropocene mean. So what is the Anthropocene? It's a proposed new geologic epoch. It was informally proposed by Paul Crutzen and Eugene Sturmer in the Global Claim Change Newsletter of May 2000. Just a small incidental article. It was formally then recommended to the Subcommission on Quaternary Stratigraphies Working Group on the Anthropocene in 2016 to the International Commission of Stratigraphy and International Union of Geological Sciences and so far it has not yet been formally accepted. But between 2017, 2017, the Anthropocene meme has become viral in the hemisphere and all that sedimented into the ambient imaginary, at least among the intelligentsia. So this just gives a, a sort of a history of how the Anthropocene and where it is headed in terms of its actual formal uh, acceptance uh, ultimately the International Union of Geological Sciences. So um, these are the guys, Crutzen, a uh, Dutch atmospheric scientist and a Nobel laureate. Uh, Eugene Sturmer, now deceased, uh, was an American quadricologist. And their paper, the Anthropocene, is historically expansive, uh, noting the proposal by Lyell in 1833 to designate the Holocene epoch, which was adapted in 1885, and referencing earlier notable thinkers, for example, George Perkins Marsh, Antonio Stapani, Vladimir Vernadsky, who had suggested that humans were a geologic force. So geologic nomenclature for units of geologic time is uniform and hierarchical. The largest spans of time are eons. Eons are divided into eras. Eras into periods, periods into epochs, and <coughs> epochs into ages. So we live, just to sort of locate uh, ourselves here, in the Phanerozoic eon, the Cenozoic era, the quaternary period, and now because it gets a little messy here, I'm putting question marks as to the epoch and the age uh, in which we uh, currently reside. So the deep uh, hierarchical order of geologic measure of time gets a little messy and paradoxical after the quaternary period. The quaternary period consists of two epochs, the Pleistocene, translated from the Greek means most recent, and the Holocene, the entire reason. The Pleistocene epoch has been going on for two million years, the Holocene for 10,000. So the Pleistocene consists of 99.995% of the quaternary, whereas the Holocene is 0, 0. 5% of the quaternary period. So back here you see the, uh, the, the Holocene there at the top in the middle can't even get onto the scale. It's, it's so small. And here, look at the last uh, segment there, here is the quaternary, and there is the Holocene. Uh, so there's a little bit of a disparity between <laughs> the two epochs that co constitute the 
uh, quaternary period. So what is the, ant uh, the Anthropocene again? The Pleistocene epoch, which is really coextensive with the quaternary period, except for the most recent 5,000 1,000s, is characterized by a series of ice ages, each lasting 100,000 years or more, thus punctuated by glacial interstadials of slightly lesser duration. The periodicity, this periodicity is driven not by the rising and falling levels of greenhouse gases, but by the Milinkovitch, Milinkovitch cycle of changes in the Earth's orbit and tilt relative to the sun and the rising and falling levels of insulation on the Earth's northern hemisphere where most of the land is, and that's where the glaciers build and, and uh, diminish. So geologically speaking, there is no Pleistocene <coughs> epoch. We live in the interglacial Flandrian age of the Pleistocene epoch. If we want to be, if we want to follow Plato and uh, trust measurement rather than the power of appearance. <coughs> so much should now be clear. The Holocene is not an epoch. If we leave Homo sapiens. Uh, out of account. Geological units of time are distinguished from one another by a boundary in the stratigraphic uh, record. The Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, for example, is marked by a thin layer of <coughs> sediment containing high levels of iridium. On the far side of the boundary, the dinosaur fossils were common, and on the near side, they were not. Iridium is a rare metal on Earth but abundant in asteroids, thus also explaining the cause of the extinction event. The Crutzen, the Crutzen stormer case for the Anthropocene was based on changes in the chemistry of the atmosphere, uh, preserved in ice cores, and, and a mass extinction event. <coughs> so the resolution of geological temporal scales, especially those long past, is poor. Narrowing down a distant boundary to a million years could be regarded as pinpoint accuracy. Crutzen and Sterner suggested that the Anthropocene began in the latter part of the 18th century, which is laughably precise. And then, ridiculously, they narrowed it down even further to 1734 when James Watt invented the steam engine. Burning of fossil fuels leads to climate change equals the Anthropocene. That was their basic argument. Others have suggested the 1950s when long-lived radioactive isotopes such as technetium-99 created in the atom bombs and globally distributed as fallout will constitute an anthropocentric signal in the stratigraphic record similar to iridium at the, uh, at the KPG boundary. The iridium marker of the uh, Cretaceous Paleogene boundary is anomalous. A more common signal is a mass extinction event, and one such is happening right now. But it began long before the 18th century. So I do think that we are in fact living in a new unit of geologic time. The stratigraphic signal will be the fossil remains of plants and animals on one side of the boundary and their absence on the other. And on the near side of the boundary will be fossil remains of new species, plants and animals, anthropogenically domesticated and or genetically engineered the old way through selective breeding or the new way through gene splicing. But when did the Anthropocene begin and is it an age or an epoch? Geological units of time are enormous, and the resolution of boundaries between them is poor. Homo, Homo sapiens has been around a mere uh, 200,000 years and began spilling out of Africa about 60,000 years ago. The spread of Homo sapiens across the face of the earth coincided with the extinction, of this, especially of large mammals called Pleistocene megafauna, body weight. Uh, more than 44 kilograms. And the numbers are staggering. In North America, 45 of 51 genera, not species, 
In South America, 58 of 79, Australia, 1927, Europe, 23 of 39, Asia, 24 of 46. And the recent um, science on the subject, it, it is pretty conclusive that these extinctions were anthropogenic. So, there's just some examples of the Pleistocene megafauna that are long gone. When Homo, Homo sapiens arrived in the Western Hemisphere, it's a matter of heated controversy, as you know, but debate concerns a difference of only a few thousand years, more or less. Roughly about the time that the Flandrian Age, otherwise known as the Holocene, began rounding to about 10,000 just to make the arithmetic easy. The Holocene climate was especially favorable for us Homo sapiens. The advent of the Holocene was followed almost immediately by the agricultural revolution. Settled agriculture enabled people to live in cities, which fostered the division of labor, the emergence of specialized artisans, artists, commercial classes, priesthoods, politicians. In short, we owe the existence of human civilization in all its diversity to the Holocene climate. So consider the near coincidence of the following phenomena. The global spread of Homo sapiens, the global extinction of the Pleistocene megafauna, the advent of the Holocene climate, the shift from foraging to settled agriculture, plant and animal domestication and selective breeding, the rise of civilizations. So this cluster of phenomena, in my opinion, marks the beginning of the Holocene. Numbers two and four, the global extinction of the Pleistocene megafauna and the, uh, 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 the ship from the foraging settled agriculture uh, will lay down a signal in the spread of rhetoric. Number three, the advent of the Holocene climate is what made everything else possible. So we can now answer the question with which we began. The Anthropocene is the Holocene. The Anthropocene, the human reason, is a new and problematic name for the Holocene. This is an age or an epoch, it's too soon to tell. By measures of geologic time at only 10,000 years, the new geologic uh, the unit of geologic time has just begun, whether it's a major or not. The androgenic mass extinction event began 60,000 years ago and is still ongoing, has and will continue to have irreversible cascading evolutionary and ecological ramifications. Androgenic changes in the chemistry of the atmosphere and oceans will have climatological ramifications for centuries. To call the new unit of geologic time the Anthropocene is not only hubristic, it is also optimistic. Recall the Cretaceous paleogene boundary that marked a thin uh, rock stratum rich in marginal, thin rock stratum rich in iridium. Its source was the asteroid that struck Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, creating the Chichu Loop. Uh, crater, Chicxulub, Chicxulub, and causing a nuclear winter that killed off the dinosaurs. The asteroid is named Chicxulub Impactor, but we do not call it a period the Chicxulub period. Uh, we call it the Paleogene period, formerly the Tertiary period. In geologic measures of time, the impact of Homo sapiens is an event almost as instantaneous as an asteroid strike. And the probability that Homo sapiens is also a one-and-done event is also very high. We shall have to earn the right to bestow our name, uh, Anthropos, on a unit of geologic time by thriving throughout such a unit of time, which is, of course, quite problematic. Now that we have a clearer idea, we'll turn now to the ethics aspect of the talk. Of 
what the Anthropocene is, a hubristic and optimistic new name for the Holocene, uh, we can begin to tackle environmental ethics in the context of the so-called Anthropocene. First, the spatial and temporal parameters of ethics are expanded by orders of magnitude. Aldo Leopold urged us to think like a mountain. A mountain is big with global climate change and global biodiversity loss, a planetary and spatial extent. And pondering ethics on a scale of geologic units of time, regardless of how we choose to name them, is unprecedented and thus calls for entirely fresh thinking about ethics. Past extinctions can only be born, born as an old Leopold's on a monument to a pigeon. Future loss of biodiversity can just be mitigated, but only if global climate change can be mitigated. The Holocene or Anthropocene climate is the synchronon of human civilization has now become one global human civilization. Global climate change poses an existential threat to global human civilization. For all its infections and injustices, the alternative, a collapse of global food systems, a human population crash, a new dark age of barbarism and fighting over remaining scraps, is no alternative at all. So the first imperative of environmental ethics and policy or the Anthropocene is to preserve the Holocene climate. It's climate ethics, in short. So, is all is climate ethics all about saving planet Earth? My answer is no. The Earth does not have a fever. The Earth is not safe. The planet is not dying. As the late great evolutionary biologist Lynn Margulis notes, life is resilient. It is fed on disaster and destruction from the beginning, 3.5 billion years ago. To me, that's to, to uh, marvelous. The human move to take responsibility for the living planet is laughable. The planet takes care of us, not we of it. Our self-inflated moral imperative to guide the way with Earth or to heal our sick planet is evidence of our immense capacity for self delusion Obviously, so is, given that global climate change a moral issue, obviously global climate change is a complex science issue involving general circulation models, atmospheric and oceanic chemistry, measuring and monitoring <coughs> average annual global temperatures, rates of pleasure, and melting, mountain pace, sea level rises. And obviously, it's a complex technology issue development of carbon neutral energy sources, carbon sequestration, adaptation technologies, geoengineering technologies as last resort. But I think obviously it's a moral issue because those least responsible for global climate change are most vulnerable to its adverse effects and least able to cope. Poor people living in marginal environments such as coral atoms tidal flats, arid lands, the Arctic. Members of future generations. And thirdly, what Aldo Leopold called our fellow voyagers in the odyssey of evolution, the other animals, plants, food and share planet. So here are just some images of the people who are at risk and the animals. And I want you to uh, note, just for future reference, this slide. African climate change is deadly serious. Reduce your CO2 emissions now. Just keep that in mind as we go, please. But it's not just these poor people and animals. Others, if you're young, more of this and probably much more, not only of this, but of a lot of other unpleasant <coughs> stuff, lies in your future in the absence of a robust and efficacious climate ethic. Uh, these images um, are the recent fires in California, the floods in 
Houston, both unprecedented. And uh, for us old people who have planned to leave our inheritance for our kids, more of this will be what we will also leave them. So moral philosophers have responded with climate ethics. In fact, a new field uh, in moral philosophy emerged in the early 1990s called climate ethics. But most climate ethicists approach global climate change with an old and limited toolkit originating in the late 18th century. I, I like to say it's like building an airplane with a steam engine. Uh, it's, uh, uh, the two leading paradigms are deontology focused on duties and obligations, irrespective of consequences. To sort of sum it up in popular terms, do the right thing, let the chips fall where they may. Uh, first articulated by Immanuel Kant, and utilitarianism focused on maximizing good outcomes minimizing that ones. The um, summary moral maxim there is the greatest happiness for the greatest number first articulated by Jeremy Bentham. But deontology and utilitarianism share two common assumptions. So there's something deeply um, uh, uniting the two. The first is that moral agents and patients are individuals belonging to an exclusive moral club based on a membership qualification. In deontology, it's being rational and autonomous, and utilitarianism being sentient and capable of suffering. The, and the second assumption is that the font of ethics is human reason in its most basic form self-consistency, or the logical law of non-contradiction. In the case of deontology, if I will it to be a universal law that everyone tell the truth or keep their promises, then I am caught in a contradiction if I tell a lie or break a promise. And in the case of utilitarianism, I demand that everyone else treat my interests in pursuing happiness and not suffering equally with their own. Thus, I am being inconsistent if I do not treat their equal interests equally with my own. So, I have gathered these two under the rubric of rational individualism as a sort of uber paradigm that dominated 20th century moral philosophy. So despite interminable and intractable disputes among the passionate partisans of deontology and utilitarianism, their common assumptions unite them as a prevailing uber paradigm in mainstream moral philosophy. Dale Jameson, the first Anglo-American moral philosopher to approach global climate change as a moral issue, immediately recognized that rational individualism, he doesn't use this word, but I, I call it, he doesn't use this name, but he does say, that it collapses when faced with global climate change. We can identify current but not future individual moral patients. I just gave you a few examples of them earlier who will be wronged by global climate change or will suffer from it, but we cannot identify individual moral agents who are wronging them or causing them to suffer. So, Dale Jameson has expressed this collapse in a set of allegories about Jack and Jill. Now, these are characters in a nursery rhyme that we Americans all learned when we were three years old. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. Um, but uh, in honor of John Cougar's ditty about Jack and Diane, uh, I call each moment of the allegory a day. So here we go. Oh, and by the way, it reminded me of um, uh, The Bicycle Thief uh, by uh, Victoria with the Sika, a classic movie from the 1960s. So <clears throat> Dale Jameson's allegory of Jack and Jill about global climate change. Did he want? Jack intentionally still steals Jill's bicycle. 
one individual acting intentionally has harmed another. The individuals and the harm are clearly identifiable and they are closely related in time and space. This is the prevailing uber paradigm in moral philosophy. This is just an instance of it. Then too, Jack is part of an unacquainted group of strangers, each of whom acting independently takes one part of Jill's bike, resulting in the bike's disappearance. So this is varied along the axis of distributed versus individual moral agents. Diddy three, Jack takes one part from each of a large number of bikes, one of which belongs to Jill. Varied along the axis of distributed or versus individual moral patients. Jack and Jill live on different continents, Diddy four, and the loss of Japanese Jill's bike is a consequence of a causal chain that begins with Jack ordering a used bike at a shop in Jamaica. Oops, excuse me. This is very along the axis of spatial scale distance between a patient. Diddy five, Jack lives many centuries before Jill and consumes materials that are essential to bike manufacturing. As a result, it will not be possible for Jill to have a bike. Very long, the axis of temporal scale interval between agent and patient. And then finally, Diddy six, acting independently, Jack and a large number of unacquainted people set in motion a chain of events that causes a large number of future people who will live in another part of the world from ever having bikes. Very long, all axes at once, and this is the moral dimensions of global climate change. So the upshots of Jameson's little biddies about Jack and Jill are, first, the emission of greenhouse gas is attributable to any given individual, even to mega-consuming individuals, is a minuscule fraction of the total. Secondly, it is impossible to assign blame to any individual Jack for climate-related harm or wrong or harm suffered by any individual Jill. Thirdly, acting from ethical motives, a voluntary reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by any individual Jack or individual Jill will have no measurable effect on total greenhouse gas emissions. So, you can get rid of your car, refuse to travel by air to the next climate ethics conference, and make sure all of your household electricity comes from wind turbines, when the annual greenhouse gas emissions are total, your sacrifices will have registered no measurable effect. Now, we're back to this slide that I asked you to recall. African climate change is deadly serious. Reduce your CO2 emissions now. It assumes that the only moral response to global climate change is voluntary individual action. It insinuates that you <coughs> are personally responsible for mitigating climate change, deflecting attention from effective collective moral agents, which are easy to identify, multinational corporations, international organizations, and national So individual voluntary, and yet this is what mainstream climate ethicists preach. Individual voluntary reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by each and every one of us. Stephen M. Gardner, author of Perfect Moral Storm, The Ethical Tragedy of Climate Change, declares that global climate change has occasioned massive moral corruption. In my opinion, however, the uber paradigm of ethics, rational individualism, prevailing in 20th century uh, Anglo-American philosophy is part of the problem, not the solution. Ordinary people need no help from philosophers or economists to recognize the free rider catch. Climate ethics must be holistic, not individualistic. It requires collective action, not individual action. So the, the ethical tragedy of climate change is not the moral corruption individual moral agents. It's the tragedy of the commons, as explained by Garrett Hardin in the 1968 
science or argument is not considered a rule of climate change, but his analysis perfectly applies. The atmosphere is a rule of commons. Mitigate global climate change requires, in his words, mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon. The term coercion seems excessively strong and repugnant, but what Hart referred to were international treaties and laws and policies. In the case of global climate change, carbon taxes, incentives for wind, solar, and other non-fossil energy, stuff like that, by mutual agreed upon, he meant democratically enacted. In regard to global climate change, national governments, international organizations, and transnational corporations are the only effective model. Individuals can do the right thing if you told them blue in the face. I don't know if that's familiar idiom, <laughs> but unless these holistic entities take on the role of moral agent, global climate change will not be mitigated or adapted. Derek Parker, furthermore, the late Derek Parker has demonstrated that members of distant future generations cannot be conceived as a collection of individual moral patients. We can only think coherently about distant future generations holistically. Those cohorts, per se, are moral patients, not their individual members. And finally, our moral concern for fellow voyages in the Odyssey of Revolution is for species, per se, not for individual specimens. So basically, it, the, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that our ethics previously has been individualistic, and we need to be thinking holistically in terms of ethics at every level, in terms of future generation, in terms of moral agents, and also in terms of our fellow voyagers in the Odyssey of Evolution, species, not individual uh, specimens. So, <clears throat> the mutual coercion part of Hardin's formula is easy enough to understand. Treaties, policies, laws. But how do we achieve mutual, the mutually agreed upon part, which is sometimes called the political will? Mainstream climate ethicists focus on the harms to moral patients and call for sacrifices on the part of moral patients. And that, I think, is proven futile. So in the context of global climate change, there has been a revival of virtue ethics, which hails all the way back to the moral philosophies of Plato and Aristotle and was revived in the new part of the 20th century by Alistair Knight. So virtue ethics is agent-oriented. It is about self-respect and becoming an excellent human being, priding oneself on being generous, moderate, fair, compassionate, considerate, and so on. So I think that cultivating virtue can be contagious. The point is to shift from sacrifice, this is what I'm having to suffer in order to help people, to being to being cool and hip and having uh, self-respect and building a, uh, a constituency for political action. Basically what Bernie Sanders' politics is all about, inspirational politics. And <clears throat> philosophers may be motivated to do the right thing by logic alone, but humans are also emotional beings and engage in what David Hume and also in the 18th century moral philosopher called the moral sentiments can have wide appeal. Do people care about the most? Themselves and their friends when they're young and have a long future ahead of them. Their kids when they're in their middle years, their grandchildren in the late years, kids and can. Global climate change poses a threat to the well-being of those we care about the most. A lot of people care about the continuity of global human civilization, stable governance and economy, the fine arts, the sciences, the humanities. We can see a future to avoid a failed states such as Somalia and Congo, gangs led by psychopathic warlords to descend into barbarism and new and irreversible dark age. So, guilt tripping finger-wagging, calling for self-sacrifice on behalf of spatially and temporally distant others, I think is counterproductive. Appealing to people's pride, virtue ethics, 
And desire to be cool and hip is a more powerful motivator than guilt. And appealing to what, in fact, people care about, moral sentiments, is a more promising approach than the desire, the desire to be consistent at all costs. Love is a more powerful motivator than duty. The second step moves from individual action to collective action, and that's essentially political. In a democracy, that means grassroots politics. Achieving the critical mass of like-minded people to get laws, policies, and treaties enacted so that everyone, whether they want to or not, is reducing their carbon footprint. Thank you all very much for your kind attention, and I am very anxious to hear your response and your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. that say this holistic ethic towards the uh, things that have to do with the planet. Um, all these ethics uh, <coughs> by the many people in the animal movement, uh, meaning individual animals in domestic uh, environments, uh, in urban environments. Uh, do you see any conflict between these uh, things? Like, well, I think that you... The, I think the conflict, I think, does remain. Um, uh -huh. And... Uh, it, it, it seems to me, to, to some extent, to be irreconcilable. Um, I, I, I come to this Minding and, um, Animals Congress uh, with some what, trepidation, because I have been an advocate of holistic ethics, of preserving species, and that sometimes involves uh, lethal control of uh, individual specimens, and it, the, if anything, the tension is beginning to escalate. Um, a Spanish philosopher, Oscar, Oscar Orta, um, is uh, advocating massive interference in nature in order to protect individual animals, which could lead to an ecological uh, holocaust, and yet he's very passionate about that, and very, very serious, and very aware of the consequences, uh, by the way. I met him at a congress in Montreal just a few months ago, and we had an interesting conversation. So, so yes, that remains a tension. Uh, in, in some ways, I'm beginning to be more responsive to changes uh, in the sciences of animal cognition. All of the ethologists will tell you who are of a certain age that when they were in school to, to mention any state of animal consciousness was professional suicide. You could only talk about the observable behavior was a result, I think, of logical positivism. You can't see it, you can't, that's not scientific. Uh, but there's been a complete swing of the pendulum, revolution in ethology, in which uh, uh, the richness of animal uh, emotions and animal cognition is, um, is becoming not only scientifically respectable, scientifically respectable, but de, de rigueur in the, in, in, in current fields of uh, animal behavior and ethology. And so the more we learn, in other words, about animal consciousness, the more we can sympathize with and, and feel an affinity with, which now begins to uh, upset, uh, to under, my, my confidence in, 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 the, in, the, uh, uh, in the emphasis on species rather than the specimens of them. So. <coughs> Thank you for the question. Yeah. 
primero tú y después él. Um, you, you mentioned um, the individual effort being a little bit um, futile uh, if we're not thinking holistically of um, climate change and the moral agents that do, that are able to have an impact are multinationals and, and governments, but these institutions are created by individuals. So wouldn't it make sense that if this person eliminates the car, then their attitude at work at the multinational might be to create trucks that have the yeah, Yes, and, and I tried to get at this, but not, not effectively enough in my talk by suggesting inspirational politics, that, that if you think that you're doing something to mitigate climate change by, you know, reducing your carbon footprint, you're not. But what you can do is to begin to affect those around you. It's, by phrase was, virtue is contagious. It, it, uh, it, and so it's essentially building a, a community of like-minded people when a critical mass is reached, then it becomes a political force. And that's when we elect representatives who will begin to change uh, the laws. I mean, just in, in U.S. politics, it's been a series of disasters. Uh, first of all, um, Al Gore w won the election against George W. Bush, but the Supreme Court took it away from him. Uh, Hillary Clinton beat, um, what's his, um, <laughs> Trump. I can't put the word President and Trump together in my, in my phrase, I'm sorry. Uh, also the popular vote. And if that, if that history had changed and Al Gore had been President of the United States, think about the difference. We wouldn't have had the Iraq War. We would have had progressive environmental politics and so on. And Donald Trump would be just you know, a failed um, TV, whatever. Uh, so, so, you know, it's, it, it's essentially political. The political begins with individuals, but it, it's only effective if it builds a community and is able to seize power. there is a very great resistance to the concept of the Anthropocene precisely for the reason that you say. It justifies the, the destruction of uh, ecosystems and species and so on. But people will say, oh, well, you're worried about that. We're in a new geological age. It's the new normal. And so uh, that has been the central focus of uh, criticism from the environmental perspective. Um, in my case, the Anthropocene has become, as a meme, um, it, it, has, it, has be, it, it has gained so much momentum that it, I feel like a resistance movement is, is not has not been very effective. I mean, it's this handful of environmentalists who are, you know, criticizing it and nobody's paying attention. So my strategy is to co-opt the Anthropocene to, to try to expose its uh, both hubristic and optimistic uh, aspects and to say, look, if, this, if, if we're going to be worthy of having a geologic epoch named after 
uh, ourselves, then we have got to be able to sustain uh, the conditions which made it possible for us to be a global uh, a mm -hmm. geologic force, essentially. Mm -hmm. So it's a strategy on my part um, uh, to, to, you might think of it as, as conceptual judo. You take, <laughs> you take advantage of their momentum and you try to steer it in a positive direction. Um, I'm thinking of the individualism. I really think that is because of consumism that we always become more and more individualist. Because before, um, so we were uh, more and more in tribes, and every now is we, we need less uh, of the humble brothers to get what we need. So every time we're more selfish. So I think we have to go backwards, and that, that it could change, like leaving those uh, things that are not. Uh, are useful uh, to become to have more stronger boundaries to preserve our culture to think about what they, things that really matter. And the other thing I was thinking is what what do you think it made that big jump for the Homo sapiens? Because we have to be less sapien now, now that we understand the other conscious of animals, um, we can understand and think more like Homo, like all other species and Homo sapiens and. What, what do you think this was a big jump that Homo sapiens took and made that this balance because every, every animal had their own strategy and can keep it on? Mm -hmm. And why are not all species going on the direction that we took? Like what made the big jump that we took for that uh, the uh, Going back to the, uh, he was originally Russian uh, biologist, uh, Dobshansky, um, and then more recently sort of uh, elaborated by uh, Edward O. Wilson, it, it was uh, what Wilson calls a, we are a eucultural, a hypercultural species, which to some extent is facilitated by, by language. And so Dobchansky, Theodosius Dobchansky suggested that we human beings participate in a parallel evolution a biological evolution and a cultural evolution and cultural evolution is Lamarckian that is to say uh, acquired characteristics are, are passed on to future generations through culture so that if we learn a new uh, uh, means of doing something discover uh, how to how to smell metals, for example, that immediately can be transferred to other members. And, and, and so we get this rapid development in culture, whereas other species seem to be tied to a Darwinian pace of evolution. So it's the, it, it's the rapidity of the Lamarckian versus the s slower speed of the Darwinian that has distinguished Homo sapiens from other pr primates and then, and, and then other animals. Now, this, of course, is also has to be tempered with a better understanding of the way animals operate. There's, there, there are examples of, in many species, of learned behavior being picked up by other members of the species and becoming a culturally uh, spread uh, phenomenon, but the, the I think the the key term for Wilson is you cultural. That's to say, or a better term would be hyper cultural uh, through the capacity of language and communications and so on. It just is expanding at, at warp speed in comparison with the the way. Changes happen among other species. That's so. This is not an original idea of mine. I'm just sort of like, this is what I learned from Theodosius Dobzhensky and Theo Wilson. Okay. Uh, you mentioned about animal consciousness. Yes. Uh, I would like your, to know your opinion about if it's worth it from your point of view, animals in captivity. Animals. In captivity. In captivity, yes. T 
is it worth having animals in captivity? Um, I, there, there are two senses of in captivity. I mean, on the one hand, there are domestic animals, which probably would fare better in captivity than if they were on their own island because of the way they have been um, uh, bred uh, to be dependent on human beings. Um, animals that are wild animals in captivity in general, it seems like you know zoos and things like that are are um, like incarceration. It's like putting animals in prison for no reason at all. I mean, that's, uh, on the other hand, uh, as we were just discussing earlier, zoos are trying to transform themselves from places that we go to gawk at other animals to ex situ conservation uh, facilities. And they work with conservationists in situ to, to uh, uh, do uh, captive breeding and that sort of thing in order to enhance conservation ethics outside. So that they're, they're making an effort to transform themselves. And then there are refuges for um, circus animals. I think recently uh, the uh, Barnum and Bailey Circus gave up its elephants, and, and so because of the uh, understanding of animal consciousness and the cruelty that that involves. So, <coughs> but in circumstances, there's a place in Tennessee, the state that I currently live in, that is an elephant sanctuary. Uh, elephants retired from the zoos and so on go to live there and it would probably not be um, appropriate for them to be returned to the wild in Africa because of their, their history. Um, similarly with chimpanzees who have been, uh, you know, raised in families to do sign language and so on. I think that what I heard an anecdote, I don't know if it's true or not, but that one of these chimpanzees re reduced to the wild was seen frantically signing, help me, you know, <laughs> this is, this is, I, I, you know, it would be, to, to make a, a, an unfortunate comparison, it would be like the, the dreamers in the United States being returned to their countries of origin and having no uh, familiarity with the language or the culture or how to get along. And, uh, so, so I, I think that that's a very complicated and uh, it's not uh, uh, yes. <laughs> scenario. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm just not convinced that that, that, that is the case. Um, there, you know, there's, as I said, there are several different domains of, of technological challenges. One of them is mitigation, the other is adaptation, and the third is geoengineering. So far, geo, geoengineering has been, of course, the most controversial and the last resort, as I try to suggest. But there might be ways of attempting to return 
climate to be handled by the sequestration of carbon. And it could be done, at least there are, it's, it's suggested that it might be done in ways that are environmentally synergistic, that, for example, just more green vegetation that, that's pulling uh, carbon out of the uh, atmosphere. Uh, so, we, I, I'm always um, reluctant to think that we can predict the future mm -hmm. and, and that there are very often unintended consequences and unanticipated consequences or unanticipated phenomena that um, might that we just can't understand. I, I think that there's one of the consequences, I think, perhaps, of the current political climate in the United States is actually to push forward climate change. I mean, those who deny climate change will be seen by people in the future as those who believe in witches, in witch hunts, and things like that. It's just too absurd to, to, to have any any real longevity, and so the fact that we have somebody who is so outrageous as the President of the United States will create sort of equal and opposite reaction, we, we hope. Um, and uh, so, I mean, th those are the sorts of, uh, like, you just don't know what's going to happen as a, as a result. So I like to say, this is my mantra, there is no survival value in, pe in pessimism. If you think that it's all over, it's all over. Uh, I, I describe myself as a desperate optimist. <laughs> it's only if you believe that there is some hope, there is some possibility that you will try to uh, bring it about. And so um, I, I try in the face of uh, all the evidence to the contrary to, <laughs> to maintain that, that, that uh, attitude. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I like your lunch. Quick question on, um, so you mentioned love is more powerful than duty, and you just mentioned about many Americans still don't believe in climate change. What do you feel about the ethics of using fear to help motivate them to enact this change with the national government and uh, multinational corporations, rather than using love? Because it doesn't feel to me that love is going to be enough to change that mind. You know, I, I was just, you know, uh, in response to this, um, by a colleague of mine, uh, we were having a conversation with Lisa Sedaris, who's a rising star in her uh, academic field is uh, religious studies, but environmental religious studies, I guess, I guess you could say. And she's conducting, she's conducted a couple of uh, congresses on the uh, Anthropocene, so we were having a little uh, conversation via, I think, Facebook messaging uh, about about the emotions, and I and she said, "What about the negative emotions? You know, love is a positive emotion. What about fear <laughs> and and anger?" Uh, and I, yeah, I, I said, yeah, I, I see your point. I think that's right. And so, I think in the future uh, iteration of this talk, I'll add <laughs> the, the negative emotions uh, uh, as uh, as also motivators. Uh, here as well, yeah. We should be the, uh, the <coughs> should scare the beat Jesus out of us, right? <laughs> and it's not mutually exclusive. You can fear losing what you love. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so it's it, it's not mutually exclusive. It's they they work together. Thank you. Uh, I would like to know your opinion on conservation, conservation strategies where uh, that consist in the um, sacrifice of a few to save the rest, such as trophy hunting, where it's one of the biggest sources of funding for conservation, but at the same time it kind of sends like the, the opposite message when it's about trophy hunting of endangered species. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think that there there are like two levels to this, as you 
pointed out, I, I was thinking the sacrifice of a few for the benefit of the species or something like that would be objectionable on the basis of individual animal, for lack of a better word, rights or, or, or our duties to animals, especially as we are learning more and more about their cognitive, cultural, and affective consciousness. Um, so that's one consideration. <coughs> is, it makes us dubious, right? And, and the other is a kind of conflicting message, as you put it, regarding conservation of endangered species. We have to take a few in order to save the rest, but the species remains endangered. Uh, and so at, at both of those, in terms of both of those considerations, I think that you have you have a point, and, and of course this is a matter of uh, real controversy. I try to, by, by the way, stay connected with as many uh, groups as possible that at least have some genuine um, concern for the environment. And one of the groups that I am in, uh, in, in some discussion with, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a shaky relationship, and, and that's the so-called free market environmentalists. And uh, they are big proponents of, um, of funding conservation through market mechanisms. And in Africa, of course, trophy hunting is one uh, way that they do that, and there's, there was recently, I can't remember, I can't document this, but there was a, a rancher in South Africa who was ranching um, rhinoceroses. And what he would do would be to anesthetize them and cut their horns off. He said, and it's the material for the rhinoceros horns like fingernails, so it grows back. And so he was in sort of having what he thought was a renewable resource that was relatively humane, it didn't involve the death of the rhinoceros, uh, from which it was called, but he was not able to continue this because of the ban on horns in the global marketplace. And so he, he had a, a free market means that he was unable to implement because of this, these uh, uh, restrictions. So that becomes a, a very interesting case, and it, it might be also the case with um, uh, ivory. So there's, there's always these tensions and, and, and uh, conflicts within the conservation community about um, market mechanisms in order to implement uh, conservation. I try to listen to both sides and keep an open mind. Uh, Felicite la página de Minding Animals, que es al evento al que el doctor Calico viene. Eh, va a ser en las instalaciones de la universidad para que ustedes puedan ingresar. El acceso es libre. Y si quieren ver el programa, si no quieren ingresar a la página de Facebook de Minding Animals, también pueden ingresar a la página del programa universitario de bioética, eh, donde vienen eh, todas las, todas las eh, cuestiones de interés para que ustedes estén informados sobre pláticas tan interesantes como las que recibimos, este, la que recibimos hoy eh, por parte del doctor Cálico. Justo él en la conferencia no va a hablar del Proposeo, entonces fue un gran lujo tenerlo aquí. Y thanks for your talk. Y lo...